as per Pia's name suggests, our spirit research has been of a foundational identity. So, 41 years ago, when Pia was set up, uh, we decided to work with the theme of our spirit research, which valued local experiential knowledge and which enabled people to systematize that knowledge in order to gain new knowledge. And our motto in the beginning of Priya was, knowledge is power. We understand that power is exercised in many different ways, including coercion and threats. But we believe that if you can convince the poor that they are poor because of God's will, then the order need not change. So if you can provide knowledge which challenges the current status quo, starting from the lived experience of people, then they can question why they are poor, why they are excluded, why they are uh, harassed, why they are <clears throat> perpetually disgraced as happens in many tribal and urban locations. So, with this intention, we have worked over the first two decades, continuing many of you have been fellow travelers in this. Then, uh, around uh, the turn of the millennium, we began to look at how Conversations in academic research field are changing. As uh, Dr. Padawan mentioned, uh, wonderful to have him here with us today. Uh, we have known each other for 45 years, and he has also been a party to the setting of Priya 41 years ago. As fellow travelers in participatory research, we face a lot of Resistance in the early years of our engagement, both with policymakers and with. To my surprise, we continue to face most resistance these days with fellow civil society. And therefore, it's a special privilege that both of you who work in civil society are here. Because I'm trying to get them to have a conversation with my academic colleagues, and it is not easy. So thank you for being patient and joining me. So in 2012, um, Bai and I were able <coughs> to become UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility Management. We decided to become co-chairs because we felt that Community-Based Research cannot be a single lecture which is located in either academia or in the community. So Bard is based in the University of Victoria in Canada with a 13 and a half hour time difference from the That's much time difference. <coughs> and uh, I am the co-chair based in Kerry. So as we began to develop our work, we were astonished and continue to be presently astonished that there are a lot of people in academia who are already <coughs> doing this kind of work many a times below the radar, without recognition, and certainly without any support <coughs> from the institutions. If they are pushed to publish five articles in uh, peer reviewed journals, then their work with the community, with society, even if they continue to do so, they will not get recognition. So we developed a program uh, called Knowledge for Change. And Knowledge for Change is now a global consortium <coughs> with uh, 25 hubs in uh, 16 countries. And we have four of those hubs in India. You have heard from uh, Dr. Madhura in MUA and Dr. Ben Umar from PRSIU uh, Blackpool. We are our oldest knowledge for change hubs. And subsequently, Christ University in Bangalore. And we recently are working with a team in Dabak, 
propagation, I suspect, is in the traffic jam. If we knock it out again. <laughs> and uh, as uh, Dr. Williams mentioned, we are hoping that this can do will also be part. K4C implies a partnership between a traditional <coughs> organization and a research academic organization. And the purpose of K4C hubs is to train the next generation of young professionals, students, community practitioners in participatory research methodology. And because this methodology cannot be learned only in the classroom, a large part of the training is by doing. And when they do it in the field, you also do research on an issue which is locally important. And that practice is the basis for learning. In uh, 2018, under the Bharat Abhiyan 2.0, UGC set up a committee, several of you are familiar with it, many of you have been associated with it, to develop what they call a national curriculum. So, UGC always has a focus or a big kind of national curriculum for community engagement and social responsibility. And I was fortunate enough to be part of that group. And then in July 2020, the National Education Policy was released. And to our very pleasant surprise, the large number of things that our expert group had discussed were finding resonance and voice in the national education policy. So you will be pleased to know, as several of our colleagues have already mentioned, that many of them have been part of a master training program conducted by UGC between April and July 2022. And in conducting those programs, of course, I was involved, Priya was involved, but several of my practitioner colleagues were also involved. So it's a special opportunity to have, you know, do all around the table together. And it's a wonderful day today, this afternoon, after lunch, UGC is launching one of the book courses on community engagement. What better day than we as well. <laughs> so, as we were developing these partnerships, and as we were trying to make the capacity building work go forward, we realized that there are different ways knowledge is understood. What is knowledge is not a common conversation for PhD students or academics doing research. And what is knowledge is not a common conversation in the community either. Knowledge is the business in academic researchers. And for communities, the business is life and knowledge is life. There is a different meaning of and understanding of knowledge. And so, uh, three years ago, our UNESCO chair initiated a global study in 10 locations about what we call bridging knowledge cultures. How, but you know, there's a lot of language these days we hear co creation of knowledge, co learning, but a lot of that co is embedded in academic history. It is not very common for community to knock on the university door and say, hey, did you partner with me? It's quite rather given. And community's knowledge culture is really understood, theorized, non -common. So, as a large part of this study, we have looked at how this bridging happens, what works, what doesn't work. And uh, in a two, three, four months, we will have more detailed findings of that. But we are going to use today's occasion to also share some of that with you as well. The most important lesson from that, of course, was that it used to be that we don't even understand what is knowledge of the communities. And 
we forget that knowledge is culturally embedded and culture is linguistically expressed. So, because much of the higher education training for people like me has been in English language, and that continues to be European languages around the world continue to be the dominant basis, it doesn't prepare me to listen to another language and the meaning of knowledge in that culture. So, this study was a fascinating experience for us. And over the years, Bart and I have begun to talk about the theme of knowledge democracy. Our theme essentially arose from this concept that multiple forms and ways of understanding knowledge, providing diversity of knowledges in a pluralistic sense, is perhaps the way to build a more just and inclusive society. And therefore, democratizing knowledge, not only its access, but also its relevance, is something that uh, we are beginning to promote. And therefore, it's a pleasure to have a partnership with Asia Democracy Research Network, which for the first time is looking at knowledge democracy as a way of understanding democratic.